Hello, welcome to the Midweek Bible video. We'll be finishing chapter 12 of Romans this week and doing our penultimate reading in Thomas Watson's All Things for Good. First though, we'll do question 38 of the New City Catechism. What is prayer? What is prayer? Prayer is pouring out our hearts to God in praise, petition, confession of sin and thanksgiving. And the verse is Psalm 62, verse 8. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Uh, so prayer, well, sometimes we just say prayer is talking to God, isn't it? And that's true. Uh, but the kind of conversation you have with someone depends on your relationship to them. And here, the kinds of conversation you have with God, what you say to God is you praise him. You ask him for help. You confess your sin. You give thanks for what he does give you. And those can each be biblically identified. Here, we really have the the sort of the idea of sharing your heart with him, which could summarise all those things, uh, but maybe particularly sounds like praise. Uh, but you have other other verses. You know, you think of one John: um, "If you do sin, you have an intercessor." Uh, or uh, or again for uh, thanksgiving. Um, you know, give thanks in all circumstances. Well, that means to God. So it's prayer. Um, the Bible defines prayer as all these things, and, and you might be able to find other categories, but that's a very good summary of what you should talk to God about if you're a Christian. Question 38, uh, 39 is, with what attitude should we pray? Which is pretty relevant given that we're talking about talking to God. With what attitude, attitude should we pray? And the answer is, with love, perseverance, gratefulness, in humble submission to God's will, knowing that for the sake of Christ, he always hears our prayers. And we'll look at that next week. So we are in chapter 8 of All Things for Good, exhortations to those who are called, because remember, all things work for the good of them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Well, so far, so good. Uh, but, and he's talked about how you can know you're, you're called according to his purpose and therefore loved and therefore um, you know that all things are working for your good. But then he, Thomas Watson is giving a practical chapter near the end of, of this sermon series. And we're on sub point three. You who are effectually called, honour your high calling. I beg, I, uh, I therefore beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Ephesians 4.1 Christians must keep decorum. They must observe what is comely. This is a seasonal advice, and when many who profess to be called of God, yet by their loose and irregular walking, cast a blemish on religion, whereby the ways of God are evil spoken of. It is Salvian's speech. Why do pagans say, uh, what do pagans say when they see Christians live scandalously? Should he Christ taught him no better? Will you reproach Christ to make him suffer again by abusing your heavenly calling? Is it one of the? It is one of the saddest sights to see a man lift up his hands in prayer, and with those hands oppress. To hear the same tongue praise God at one time and at another time lie and slander. To hear a man in words profess God and in works deny him. Oh, how unworthy is this! Yours is a holy calling. And will you be un unholy? Do not think you may take liberty as others do. The Nazarite that had a vow on him separated himself to God and promised abstinence. Though others did drink wine, it was not fit it for the Nazarite to do it. So though others are loose and vain, it is not fit for those who are set apart for God by effectual calling. Are not flowers sweeter than weeds? You must be now a peculiar people, 1 Peter 2, 9. Not only peculiar in regard of dignity, but deportment. Abhor all motions of sin because it would disparage your high calling. Question, what is it to walk worthy of our heavenly calling? Answer, it is to walk regularly, to tread with an even foot, walk according to the rules and axioms of the word. A true saint is for canonical obedience. He follows the canons of scripture, as many as walk according to this canon, Galatians 6.16. When we leave men's inventions... And cleave to God's institutions. When we walk after the word as Israel after the pillar of fire. This is walking worthy of our heavenly calling. To walk worthy of our calling is to walk singularly. 
Noah was upright in his generation. Genesis 7.1 When others walked with the devil, Noah walked with God. We are forbidden to run with the multitude. Exodus 23 verse 2 Though in civil things singularity is not commendable, yet in religion it is good to be singular. Melanchthon was the glory of the age he lived in. Athanasius was singularly holy. He appeared for God when the stream of the times ran another way. It is better to be a pattern of holiness than a partner in wickedness. It is better to go to heaven with a few than to hell with the crowd. We must walk in an opposite course to the men of the world. To walk worthy of our calling is to walk cheerfully. Rejoice in the Lord evermore, Philippians 4.4. 4. Too much drooping of spirit disparages our high calling and others suspect a godly life to be melancholy. Christ loves to see us rejoicing in him. Corzinus in his hieroglyphics speaks of a dove whose wings being perfumed with sweet ointments drew the other doves after her. Cheerfulness is a perfume to draw others to godliness. Religion does not banish all joy. As there is a seriousness without sourness, so there is a cheerful liveliness without lightness. When the prodigal was converted, they began to be merry. Luke 15, 24. Who should be cheerful if not the people of God? They are no sooner born of the Spirit, but they are heirs to a crown. God is their portion, and heaven is their mansion, and shall they not rejoice? To walk worthy of our calling is to walk wisely. Walking wisely implies three things. One, to walk warily. The wise man's eyes are in his head, Ecclesiastes 2.14. Others watch for our halting, therefore we had need look to our standing. We must beware not only of scandals, but of all that is unbecoming, lest thereby we open the out mouths of others in a fresh cry against religion. If our piety will not convert men, our prudence may silence them. To walk courteously, the spirit of the gospel is full of meekness and politeness. Be courteous, 1 Peter 3.8. Take heed of a morose, supercilious behaviour. Religion does not take away civility, but refines it. Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the children of Heth. Genesis 23, 7. Though they were of a heathenish race, yet Abraham gave them a civil respect. Paul was of an affable temper and made all things to all men, that by I might by all means save some. In lesser matters, the apostle yielded to others, that by his obliging he might win upon them. To walk magnanimously, though we must be humble, yet not base, it is unworthy to prostitute ourselves to the lusts of men. What is simply imposed ought to be zealously opposed. Conscience is God's diocese where none has right to visit, but he who is bishop of our souls. 1 Peter 2.25 We must not be like hot iron, which may be beaten into any form. A brave spirit of Christian will rather suffer than let his conscience be violated. Here is the serpent and the dove united. Sagacity and innocence. The prudential walking com comports with our high calling and does not a little adorn the gospel of Christ and to walk worthy of our calling is to walk influentially to do good to others and to be rich in acts of mercy Hebrews thirteen sixteen, good works honor religion as Mary poured the ointment on Christ so by good works we pour ointments on the head of the gospel and make it give forth a fragrant smell Good works, though they are not causes of salvation, yet they are evidences. When with our Saviour we go about doing good and send abroad the refreshing influence of our liberality, we walk worthy of our high calling. And here is matter of consolation to you who are effectually called. God has magnified rich grace towards you. You are called to great honour to be co-partners with the angels and co-heirs with Christ. This should revive you in the worst of times. Let men's reproach and miscall you. Let men reproach and miscall you. Set God's calling of you against man's miscalling. Let men persecute you to death. They do but give you a pass and send you to heaven the sooner. How may this cure the trembling of the heart? What though the sea roar, though the earth be unquiet, though the stars are shaken out of their places, you need not fear. You are called and therefore are sure to be crowned. That final paragraph, obviously, in a way, is the final exhortation of the whole chapter. The, that is a final summary, which is that for all these reasons, you can have consolation uh, because 
you are effectually called if you know that and therefore you're sure to be crowned because that's the necessary result the other little takeaway i had was that idea of to walk worthy of our calling is to walk influentially um though you could you could possibly talk about that use of the image from john of mary pouring the ointment on christ as uh, so by good works we pour ointments on the head of the gospel um oh when you might say well surely mary uh, martha was the one who was doing the good works and it was mary who's pointed to i think it's interesting that here watson knows that and transposes it to say instead um that good works are a form of intimacy with god uh, good works that are you know spirit given are intimacy with god uh, but moreover the idea that you're seeking to win people to christ if you're the corollary of walk well walk in a worthy manner so that you don't disgrace the gospel is it means walk in a worthy manner so you adorn the gospel you're not looking for a neutral conclusion uh, but an adorning glorifying god glorifying jesus glorifying conclusion uh, yeah, next week we'll be finishing that with uh, the section you see there concerning god's purpose okay let's finish chapter 12 of romans verses 9 to 21 um, of that chapter let love be genuine abhor what is evil hold fast to what is good love one another with brotherly affection outdo one another in showing honor do not be slothful in zeal be fervent in spirit serve the lord rejoice in hope be patient in tribulation be constant in prayer contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality bless those who persecute you bless and do not curse them Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with them who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one, evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honourable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry feed him if he is thirsty give him something to drink for by so doing you will heap burning coals on his head do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good so the first subsection of romans 12 frames the whole application to follow actually in a way all the way to the end of chapter 15 at least and the big theme is offer yourself as a living sacrifice. Uh, you could apply this back to what we've heard from Watson about cha in chapter eight about finding a security in knowing you're called. And then so after those first two verses of Romans 12, the, verses three to nine, Paul applied this to the matter of gifts and skills in the church. Now, the rest of Romans nine expands the, uh, Romans 12 expands the scope of that lesson to the general behavior of Christians. It's a form of specific to general rhetorical form. Paul gives a linchpin example of offering yourself as a living sacrifice in terms of giving within the church. Here's a one example of that. Here's a core example. And he now says, with that principle in mind that I've established, this is how it applies generally. And a further header explaining this passage is verse 9. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. This is both generally explanatory of the next few chapters, but it particularly applies to the contrast drawn in this section, Romans 12, 9 to 21. For instance, here is a way to measure your love for one another. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honour. On the other hand, do not be slothful in those things. Live in harmony with one another. Uh, that's verse 16. Do not be haughty. And this is a rhetorical pattern, of course, and it's one found in both Paul's letters, in other New Testament work, and in other, other ethical treatises in the Greco-Roman world. But here it's being used specifically to describe the behaviours that fit the transformation of your mind, if you are a Christian. Um, that, you know, that's uh, the transformation of your mind by God, which is back in verse 2. We can also subdivide this section into two, depending on the sort of situation envisioned. So verses 10 to 13 seem generally to be about behaviour in the church. That's uh, verses 15 and 16 might as well also touch on that. We'll get to that. Love the brothers. Show honour. 
to others ostentatiously, which means in part to care for their needs. Be fervent, serve the Lord. Again, contribute to the saints' needs, verse 13. Host them. So that seems like it's about maybe more about people in the church. Hospitality, remember, was a great value in the ancient Middle East, and indeed it still is now. Um, in an unsafe land, guest right was almost sacred. Bear that in mind when we look at verse 20 later. And we're down here. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. The idea that we should welcome people into our lives, in the immediate context of verse 13, that's the saints, the members of the church, is a general mark of Christian behaviour. You offer safety and care to your guests, uh, and we should generally make a practice of giving space to people in our home homes. That's the principle here. The mindset is clear as well, that the Christian should treat others well just as they encourage to treat guests well here. This isn't a uh, give our hospitality ostentatiously, but anytime you're not, you're allowed to act like a, a brigand and a, and a tribesman. <laughs> you know, you have to really have that general attitude. Now, verses 14 to 21 mostly envision a different situation. How do you deal with difficult people or those who harm and persecute you? The first little subsection then, we've said, seems to mostly deal with the church. The second mostly deals with those outside the church, particularly those antagonistic to it. And the beginning of this section in verse 14 and the end down in verse 21 are connected. There is a call for returning good for evil and not instead being consumed by that evil in one way or another. The Christian blesses the persecutor. But how does that connect to verses 15 and 16 here in the middle? Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with one another, etc. Well, these two verses certainly apply in all situations. Verse 15 is citing Jesus after all, rejoice with them who rejoice. Verse 16 echoes Paul's advice about ch uh, church life, Peter's advice in 1 Peter about being a good citizen. So it could apply in any number of situations. But they have a certain pointed value when related to persecution, to the problem of persecution. You rejoice, given he's just said, bless those who persecute you, rejoice with those who rejoice. You rejoice and weep with your persecutors. Similarly, verse 16 points to a Christian's behaviour, uh, not just in church, be peaceable, open to all ranks in society, but in relation to pagans as well. Do not be overproud of your insight and wisdom. Yes, trust God, but respect what non-Christians, even your persecutors, have to say. After all, if it's true, it's ultimately God's truth, not their truth. And verse 17 seals the impression that this issue of rejoicing, weeping, uh, living harmoniously has to do with what uh, with when you find your neighbours difficult. So verse 17 is here. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honourable. You're not meant to repay their evil with your evil. Do what is honourable instead. But surely it's honourable to get your own back sometimes. That's honour culture, isn't it? Paul seems to think that Christian honour rests upon blessing and not cursing. Well, why? Well, it's obvious, perhaps, but it has to do with the universality of sin. All have been consigned to disobedience from the last chapter, or again, all have fallen short from chapter 3. Your neighbour is to be pitied, not hated. They're in the same state you were. And what a blessing it would be to you for them to be saved. So then verse 18, live peaceably with all. Do not find excuses for tendentiousness. Don't be soft over matters of truth and the glory of God. But for yourself, as Paul puts it elsewhere, why not rather be dishonoured? Honour God, don't worry about your own honour. And those instructions live in harmony with one another, live peaceably with all, follow bless those who persecute you. They're followed by an explica uh, explication, verse 19, never avenge yourselves, leave it to the wrath of God. As it's written, vengeance is mine, I'll repay, says the Lord. God will avenge where vengeance is needed. The Christian can offer blessing instead. And one parallel here is that Jesus says he did not come to condemn. The condemnation was already in place. Jesus came to bless and to save even those who crucified them. Forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. 
He saved Paul, indeed. And this is pointing to the greater standard of nourishing and looking after those who hate me. But then Paul says something odd, still citing Proverbs. For by so doing, you'll heap burning coals on your enemy's head. Paul has so far said this is all about looking out for your enemy's good. But th is this all a trick just to burn your enemy up? Um, are you meant to be nice to them and do good to them and come to bless them, but all really to curse them? It's possible that's the meaning. Um, and indeed, God will avenge. So those who sin and do not repent will be punished in hell. And those who sin against the church uh, and therefore against Christ directly will have a particularly, a pro you know, that there will be a concomitant punishment for that. But the context before and after here suggests the purpose of this passage, at least, is not to look toward that sort of punishment. In fact, I think the obvious key is the final verse. Let do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You don't return evil for evil. You don't seek vengeance. You seek to overwhelm evil by good. And the best way to serve your neighbour is to be good to them, it says. So when you're hospitable, when you honour honor them, that's to bless them, to serve them. And what does that do? Well, perhaps the pouring of the coals upon the head, uh, given that could be used in the context of overwhelming an argument as much as anything, is you crush their evil with your God-given good so that they see Christ through you. So, in Thomas Watson's terms, uh, you adorn the gospel. From now on in the letter, Paul is going to address, generally largely address, particular topics with the next leading on from this one. Paul has explained how to deal with pressure and persecution at a personal level. How does the Christian deal with the state, then, in the grand scheme of things that can be cruel or godless? Personal level, this is the advice. What about a corporate level of persecution? Well, we'll move on to that next week.